Hello, hello everyone, and、uh, welcome to Stars and Bound, brought to you by Stars Group. I'm your host Anna Nadena, and this is the show where we talk to inspiring founders and experts to get a scoop on how they made their business a success. And、uh, our first guest, Peter Leonard, welcome to the show. Hi, Anna. It's Thank you. It's great to have you here. here. Awesome.、Thank、so、you. Peter is the founder of MyWorks. Uh, sales products that integrates QuickBooks accounting, CRMs, and inventory management. And recently, my books has become a part of Sales Group. So, welcome to the family. And we're here to, to talk here. about what it means and、uh, everything that happened in between. So, Peter, how do you feel about it? <laughs> Looking forward to it. It's been an exciting journey, of course,、um, up to here, and and even more exciting to come, I believe. So,、um, it's it's been been quite a journey, and、um, we're excited to be part of SAS Group to、um, make make that journey even more of a success. That's amazing. Well, it's great to have you here. So let's maybe、Thank、start、you. with with your background. If、uh, somebody doesn't know about it, and there is a great, great article that you should、uh, see at Bootstrappers dot com about Peter and his journey. So could you please tell us a bit about you? Thanks. So I'm the oldest of, of six kids.、Um, went to a small small college in in、uh, Michigan called Northwood University. And、uh, currently down here in Fort Worth, Texas,、um, with my wife and our daughter,、um, I、uh, really enjoyed entrepreneurship from an early age, and that was my major、uh, in, in college as well. And、um, just kind of thinking, thinking through ideas, solving problems,、um, looking for a better solution、um, is is what what brought me to to build my works, and it's just something that I've enjoyed doing、um, even before then, and, and of course ever since. That's amazing, but you know. Accounting, CRMs. This is maybe not a so sexy business, right? That、uh, no, a twenty-something-year-old <laughs> wants to do. So, how did you come up with an idea? Yeah. So, I really just, even though I didn't major in accounting, I, I enjoyed accounting since I was about actually fourteen years old.、Um, I would buy computers on eBay and and fix them up and, and resell them. And I was like, I need to figure out my margins, and I need to to get QuickBooks and 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 use it to to just you know be able to to track my numbers better and, and know what I'm doing. So at about 14, I I at the, at the time you have to walk into a store and and buy it in a box.、Um, so I did that and and just kind of started playing around with QuickBooks and really enjoyed just the concept using QuickBooks at that time, which of course it's it's grown quite a bit since then,、um, and just kind of. Seeing how accounting fits in with with the other parts of business, whether you know, really, no matter what industry you're in,、um, and so that kind of just stuck with me as as we we I, I got into college and、um, was looking for problems to solve and, and started actually as a web design company、um, where we would build build e-commerce sites for our users、um, and help them kind of get off get off the ground and launch. And in the course of doing that, really about a year or two into it. Um, we would be talking to these users and hear how they had successful stores and, and were doing well, but they were having pain points and problems as they tried to integrate accounting into that.、Um, whether it was just keeping track of orders in their accounting platforms,、um, managing inventory, just managing customers and, and products, and so we thought that there had to be a better way to do that. And so as we were talking to them and, and really seeing, looking at the market out there, seeing that there, there really weren't solutions that were. Listening to their users and and actually solving the, the real world problems that these users had,、um, we were already very familiar with software and, and just you know in the process of, of building sites and so we kind of pivoted our dev team and and began to work on building a product that could actually solve those problems by listening to those users,、um, and that's one of the valuable lessons that we we even hold very strongly today is how important it is to to listen to your users and make sure that the software you're building is. Not just solving what you think the problems are, but the problems that your users actually are having. Awesome. All right. So let's、uh, let's get to this whole、uh, looking at competitors, not looking at competitors debacle. So did you do any、yeah. competitor research? Did you、uh, look at what other people are doing, or you just heads down, just just worked on your solution? A lot of heads down because we we believed in what we were building and we knew there was a reason we were building it, of course, and and you know we weren't just building it to, you know, just be another so, another solution out there in the mix of of alternatives. But we were building it with the key objectives of you know being building software that that works and does what we say it will, 
and also is a solution that, that is better than the rest and that it solves as many of our customers' needs as it, it can. And so because of that, we didn't do, we weren't, you know, competitive research wasn't something that we was a week to week thing. Um, it would be more of it maybe a quarter to quarter. Uh, of, we felt it was important just to keep an eye on the market and just see what competitors were doing. Um, you know, watch just the industry as a whole, just because we were in, inside of it. Um, but in general, it was really feedback that we hear from our users. And even today, we take that feedback seriously as we're talking to users that maybe aren't just a first time to the industry, but they've used other solutions that are competitors to us. And we ask them all the time, we say, hey, you know, what did you like about this? And what didn't you like about it? And we, we factor those, even that information into how we make decisions too. Um, so I think important enough to keep an eye on, but but sometimes you do have to be heads down and focus on what you're doing. And especially right. if there's specific reasons for that and make sure that that's your number one. Right. How, how long did it take approximately to get some kind of a working product on the market? Um, probably from, from day one when we started kind of having the idea or, or building it, I would say around six to eight months. Um, and the way that we, we built it was, um, of course, very user centric. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't get to, you know, launch day and we were like, oh, these, you know, there's these six features that we now realize that users need that we never even thought about. So as we were building it, we were really trying to stay in contact with, with, you know, potential users, users that might use it, users that were using other solutions and just kind of just field test ideas and make sure that the direction we were going up to launch, which was just a very simple version one was still the right direction. So eight months probably to, to launch, but then after that, we were very rapidly adding features. And especially in the beginning, um, when our development process was a lot leaner, we would prioritize based on you know what, what the most users were asking for at that time. Um, so we really rapidly developed features in the beginning, which led, has led to a very robust product that we have now, um, but just developing for what, what our users were asking for was, was what got us off the ground originally. Right. Uh, that's a, actually, uh, actually a very interesting thing that I want to uh, elaborate here a little bit. So um, you say, you know, customers are asking for features and for a lot of startups, uh, this is a very dangerous ground where they just yes. simply start building whatever customers are asking for. So how did you prioritize? How did you choose uh, the features that would go live? I think one of the, the, the things that really helped us in that case where we, if we didn't have this, this background, we really would have, we could have very easily gone on that path was just our background experience with both e-commerce coming out of the building e-commerce sites, um, as well as accounting, which I had just from, from, you know, kind of just being familiar with QuickBooks from, for a while at that point. So we were able to kind of that when we would see ideas or, or, or questions or, or feedback requests from users that asked for maybe kind of wild features that we were able to kind of field test those internally and say, Hey, you know, is this something we've seen in the past? Does this actually make sense on an e-commerce level? Does it make sense on an accounting level? And in the few cases where we, we got kind of those, those wild feedback items, we would either say, you know, certainly understood this is, this is probably more of a niche feature that, that we don't, we wouldn't be able to, to highly prioritize in, in the realm of other features that we're currently working on. Um, but we also were able to op offer custom development. Um, and that's something that we've, we've been able to continue offering where we still do see users who have very, very specific workflows and they know, and we know that those workflows aren't common in, in that industry. And it's not something that another user would use, but there are cases where we're able to offer kind of custom development services when it's that important to their workflow that it's necessary. So, and that's not something you see often in this industry. Right. Okay, so just a couple of questions about the founding story and the, the very early days, because I really want to move on to you scaling the business, because that happened fairly fast, All right? So uh, how did you how did you validate your idea and uh, created the initial pricing strategy for my works? Yeah, obviously very tricky, and there's there's a lot of different ways to to skin a pricing strategy. Um, but early on, especially as we were doing that that initial bit of competitor research. We found that, and it's quite common in the SaaS industry today, and it, it really has been for a while, that there, there can be a lot of pricing tiers out there. And so we'd see a lot of, of our potential competitors have, you know, six or seven different pricing boxes of, you know, just very finely splitting the features or the limitations that they would assign to each pricing category. And the initial feedback we got from our users as well as ourselves was that, you know, this isn't 
an awesome way to have a relationship with your user, especially if they're constantly running into those tiers. And you know, every two months or every quarter, they come to you with a problem and it's like, oh, well, you're in the wrong tier. You need to, to, to move over a tier. So initially, and, and we just, because of the way that our product grew, um, we, we didn't stay with this, but initially we just launched with one pricing tier and, and that was it. It was a specific amount per month. That was the only plan we offered and there was, it was unlimited features and, and all of our features were in that plan. And originally I think that was very helpful to both onboard users and see what features they were asking for and get really great data from what features were being used, how often they were being used and give us data that we could then use as we started to break that into multiple pricing points. Um, but it also was a great contrast to, co to competitors when users were looking at those solutions and saying, Hey, I have five different tiers to choose from, from this one. And, and instead my works has just one tier that has everything. Um, so I think that was valuable early on, both in giving us data and in, in acquiring users. Um, but, and now, we've tried, really tried to stick to that as much as we can going forward. Right now we have three tiers, um, which doesn't include a completely free plan, which we were able to offer our users. Um, but we've really tried to keep those, those minimal, um, and not kind of focus on, on just pricing our users out, but really offering features that are valuable and that add value. Okay, that's amazing. Uh, I think that's a very smart uh, approach to it. So let's talk a bit about scaling. Like, when did you decide that it's time to maybe uh, scale our sales team or or get more um, enterprise clients or something like this? So when has it started happening for you? I mean, really, from from day one, or. We kind of knew looking forward at, at some level that, you know, if we're going to be successful that, with this, we have to scale. So the short answer there could be that we had an eye on that from, from day one of saying that, hey, we need to build a product that scales. We can't just be offering this. We can't be thinking of users tomorrow or next month. We have to be thinking of users in five years from now. Um, so that was always something that we had just a focus on. And we really tried to, to jump on that as early as possible, whether that was with partnerships and, and we would reach out to. Um, just start building relationship with with other partners that, for example, software or, or software alternatives that our users would use in addition to us, um, or just just industry level, whether it's it's you know e-commerce platforms or accounting platforms that our users use, and really try and build strong relationships with them um, to be able to to use those relationships in in, in a way that that's very beneficial for for both those platforms and us um, to be able to continue to grow. Uh, and so really, as we, we continue to build our product, and I think our product is, is a lot of what allowed us to scale, because as we continue to build features in, we were doing so at a pace that we didn't see in our comp competition. So our competition, in some cases, has stayed a lot very similar to the same as they were five years ago. And we've continued to listen to our users, continue to build you know, those features into our, our software. And I think that's what's, what's brought us to scale because of the attention that we give to our users. Um, that we see users, of course, coming to e-commerce more now than you than before due to COVID. Um, but also, you know, existing e-commerce users that are looking for a better solution as they scale and their needs change and they want to find a platform that, that can change and scale with them. Um, but yeah, just in general, the, the short answer to that question is that we really try to focus on partnerships, marketing, SEO uh, very early. And we decided to scale our, for example, our sales team um, about probably one year into it, um, as we were, you know, we, we, again, as part of our strategy of listening to our users, we would offer live demo calls and we still do, uh, as well as live setup calls after they, they jump on. And that's been a great source of feedback, um, of just understanding what our users need and also what their reaction is to our software. Um, but as in the process of doing that, we just had, had more and more just activities that we needed hands on to, to help with. and. Um, we decided to scale our, our team about, I'd say about one, one year into it. Um, and we've been very, very lucky with, with the team that we've been able to build. Um, but it's, it's been quite a lot, bit of effort in terms of just, just recruiting and hiring, but it, it's, it's so much paid off. Our team is, is wonderful and they're a lot of the reason why we are where we are today. Who was your first hire? Um, was our, our marketing. Yes, um, was Sol and our marketing team. Um, so she okay. was, um, had, a, had a very similar interest in e-commerce, um, and, and an amazing, very creative, um, marketing talent that very, that complemented the talent in marketing that I don't have. Uh, and, and she was able to, um, really to kind of take on marketing and, and help with, with just direction of where we were going. Um, 
and, and kind of both understand the e-commerce space and, and how we market and, and how to successfully market to that. That's amazing. I love how you openly talk about the fact that you don't have experience in marketing and that that's okay because then you just focus on on hiring the best talent out there and just to give, give them yeah. the authority to do that. Uh, I want to come back a little bit to um, when you said that maybe your competitors were not moving uh, as fast as you were moving. What do you think was the reason? Was it the small team? Was it the fact that you know you never really uh, knew where the the exit is and like where you're going? Um, maybe a combination of that. I think because of our small team, we were able to pivot and make decisions very quickly. And that's one of the things that I think we're still able to do at, at some level now as well. Um, and is very important to us to be able to continue doing that and not getting get sucked down in a process, which SaaS Group has been very helpful with. Um, but I think also just because of um, the way that, that we really weren't building with a, an exit in mind. So we weren't we were building and say, hey, in five years, this is the plan. You know, this is where we're going, and and we're going to exit for in whatever route that 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 ends up being. Our plan was simply to you know continue solving problems for our users, continue offering valuable software to them, and we always say internally, this is it's a fun industry to be in, especially with the software that we sell because it solves problems, and you're not sitting behind a desk and you know dealing with an angry customer because your software you know either doesn't work or it's not a a, a value add and it's it's creating problems. So. We're very lucky to be in, in a very fun environment because our users are very happy and they're thankful that we're saving them time and that even though they're, they're of course, paying for our software, they'd be paying even more if, if they didn't have our software and, and, and the, the effort that they'd be making up for it. So we're, we're lucky that, that we have, you know, happy, happy users to deal with. That's a great motivation. Well, uh, yeah, well, it's a very interesting, like you, as you said, um, that you never had an exit in mind. So what happened? <laughs> Why there was an exit? Yeah, when did you start thinking about right, it? Right. It kind of just happened somewhat naturally. Um, it was end of 2021. Um, and again, not, not so, we, had, we would get cold offers, you know, every, every few months. Um, and they were just something I, I completely ignored. Um, and then kind of about into 2021, I just decided to maybe just entertain one of those offers and just kind of see what, see what happened. Really low expectations, didn't expect anything out of it. And that's really about where it ended was the, the, the um, other party wasn't extremely serious. Um, due diligence wasn't anything huge, um, but it just ended up, you know, kind of parting for just, just not a good fit or not the right reasons. And so it was kind of at that point where I, I was like, you know, hey, is this something that I think is valuable enough to consider or just because of the time that I would be spending on it and, and was spending on it, is it something I should just, you know, stop, stop considering and go back to, you know, head down and, and continue building the business. And so I thought that it was valuable enough just, just to kind of scope out and see what opportunities were out there. Um, it was at that point, we were of course still continuing to grow, but the growth that we had ahead of us needed a lot of resources. Um, especially if we were going to do it the right way and do it quickly um, to be able to, you know, stay up with the market. And so because of that, I, and it was really perfect timing that we, we I think, came across SAS Group, um, that it was really the decision didn't get made until, you know, halfway through the process. When I had met SAS Group, we had a couple conversations, we talked about vision, what steps looked like going forward. And it really wasn't at that point until I actually made the decision of saying, you know, hey, the stars align. There's a lot of boxes here that are checked. Um, and I can see looking, you know, kind of down two different roads, I can see a very successful path with SAS Group um, versus if I were to continue building on my own. Um, and that's really when when the decision was made, because all before that, I tried to keep a very, you know, balanced, low expectation approach that, you know, hey, we can talk about this and have conversations, but I'm certainly not getting my hopes up and I don't have a strong expectation that there needs to be something that comes out of this before a decision is made. Right. But um, I also think that for, for a lot of founders and whoever is listening, you know, it's kind of a story of like, we wanted to grow, but maybe we didn't have enough resources. So the question I think here would be, why not go and raise a round? Um, Great question. And I think that for us, that we, we were, we've been bootstrapped, of course, since from, from ground zero until that point. 
And so I think for us, especially, and I, I'm not, I don't have a ton of experience with M&A. We've got, we went through several rounds of due diligence with other buyers before SaaS group. So I, I had an idea of the process and, and we're at that point was somewhat familiar with it. Um, but that just didn't seem appealing to me on a long-term level of me being involved with, with the company versus partnering with, and that, that's really what has been so great with SaaS group of, of really treating it as a partnership and saying, Hey, you know, we're not acquiring you to, you know, grow 20 times and then go, go spin it off. Um, we want to, you know, bring you into a family, build that together, um, complement that and, and do what we can to help continue to grow in a sustainable way. Um, and that was a lot more attractive than going and raising around, giving up equity, having less autonomy because of that, and just kind of still being involved on that level. Because at some point there was certainly a decision where I would either continue to be involved with my works or not. And that's really what came down to it with SAS Group was I was it was attractive to me to stay because of just the passion and so much of our, our vision aligning that we were all on the same team. And it was it was a great re-motivator for not just myself, but for all of our team internally to be able to kind of just step up and continue going in the right direction, just, just faster and with more resources. That's and amazing. I don't think we would have had that had we raised a round. Okay. That's a, that's a very interesting point. So uh, I guess what, what I want to say, uh, what, what I want to ask next is uh, I know that you've had quite a few offers before that, and eventually you went uh, with the, with a broker from my, um, sorry, from acquisition.com, right? Yes. Um, acquired, acquired, yeah, acquired, used to be oh, microacquire.com, or <laughs> right, used to be microacquire, micro now is, is acquire.com, yes. Yes. Um, so why, why did you make this decision? Why not continue just uh, doing it on your own? Yeah, and it was right around that that point I mentioned earlier, where I kind of was had to make the decision internally of saying, "Hey, is this something I want to continue with?" Because before that point, I had not been using a broker and just were, were, was looking at offers that were were, were coming to me. Um, and so it was because at that point I decided that I wanted to get at least somewhat serious about entertaining offers and seeing what was out there that um, I came across Microquire and, and Paul and Andrew over there did a, a great job of just handling the relationship very early on. Um, but it, it was really just perfect timing and, and very, very great timing for both of us as Microacquire was just launching their managed program. So it, it was a, a kind of a, a more private relationship where they would be able to introduce us initially to specific 20 plus relationships that they already had, one of those being SAS Group. Um, so as we kind of had initial conversations with Microacquire to see what that fit looked like, um, that seemed very attractive and, and like a great fit that would not involve a tremendous amount of time on my end of fielding requests from other public buyers and trying to have to figure out, you know, both due diligence on that, on, on that level and their level of seriousness, where if there were connections that MicroQuarity had that were serious, were in the right industry, matched where we were looking to go, um, that that was very much worth a try. And it ended up being, being perfect. Um, MicroQuarity was super helpful during the due to, due diligence process, and really the whole acquisition process of just acting as a helpful advisor to myself. Um, but our um, Paul with, with microacquires, just the way that they work, which was very, very um, successful, aligned so closely with how SAS Group's acquisition process was. It was just, it, the, the process was so seamless um, that it made that, that process a lot easier. And, and certainly there were ups and downs, but just the way that, that you know, everything was very transparent um, we were looking ahead. I mean, we, we were doing goal planning and, and next steps halfway through the due diligence process of um, just kind of figuring out what benefits and values my works had, where we wanted to go. And that was great to be able to start planning that just in the middle of due diligence to see, you know, here's the light at the end of the tunnel, here's the path where we're going and how much do our visions align. And, and they certainly did. That's pretty great. But how, how long did it take from the offer to the deal? Um, I, less than three months. Um, so from the initial offer, um, I wanted to say we, we did due diligence for about two months and then, then closed right at the end of it. So it was certainly a, a very hectic three months, but um, we were able to, to keep it not, not dragging out too much longer than, than about three months. 
That's amazing. So, uh, well, I would assume since you're, you know, in accounting, right, uh, all your documentation has been in place, right? But uh, did you do anything <laughs> yeah, specifically for this? Uh, you mean more as preparation or just also in the yeah. middle? Yeah. As um, in terms of preparation, I, I, I want to say we didn't do too much other than micro acquire. One of the first things that they helped us with was kind of just gathering relevant information, building kind of a 20 page doc that just laid out, Hey, what is my work? What, what are the, the, what are the, what, what does it do? Um, you know, what are the, the kind of, what's a general summary of the, the business. Um, but other than that, really the preparation was just the way we, we try to do business internally, which is just as organized as possible. So it's, we're, we're certainly not perfect, but we were able to, um, we've been able to be somewhat organized in, in a way that made due diligence very easy. So when we were dealing with, with requests, whether it was on a tech level or a financial level, or even on a business level, um, we were, we had that, that data already and it wasn't something we had to go back and grab. And I've, I've certainly heard stories that I think I, before that point, I had heard enough horror due diligence stories that I knew somewhat what to expect. And, and I kind of was able to, to maybe do some small prep on the, the financial or the, the, the business end that helped us avoid some of those those worst worst case scenarios so that's great uh okay so uh, i want to ask more about your personal experience right and the experience of your team so how did you present it to the team was it like hey guys you know someone's buying us or yeah i mean it was it was certainly uh something that, that i i put a lot of thought into because our team is, is very, very important to me. And like I said, there, we, we wouldn't be here without them. And we're, we're all a very close family and very, very, we work together so well. Um, and so because of that, it was something that I, I wanted to put a lot of thought into of, of, of how we, we broach this with them, but because of the direction and the reason that we were going and, and the reason that we had signed on with SAS group was to grow my works even further. And they had a lot of respect for what we've built so far and the direction that we, we have gone in and want to go on, that it was really just a great natural extension of the journey that we, the vision that we already had. And so because of that, I really use that to, when we introduce this to our team of saying, hey, you know, nothing's changing and we have now more resources to move forward even, even faster and be more successful than we even have been in the past. Um, I think it was very helpful that I stayed on. And that was really something that I think was part of the decision anyways, because I don't, I don't think I would have made the decision because of our team and, you know, the, the level of passion that I have both for our team and for our product, it would have been rather difficult for me to step away, especially early on, but even after one or two years, um, just because of how, how well we work together, how much, how, how important they are to the, to myself and to the company that. It, I knew that if I was going to make that decision, it would be, I would be going along with them. So that was of course very helpful. Um, but it was also helpful that it wasn't just, you know, something that was being spun off to a um, VC company that was going to, you know, change everything, you know, put new people in place, take, take other people out, um, change processes. It, it was really just um, a very orderly transition where the team knew that they were valued. Um, they remain in the same roles and we just were able to work with more resources than we had before. And we've already seen that in the last six months. Um, so it's, it's been a great reaffirmation to them. Um, but really just kind of being very, very steady about it and knowing that there's nothing that they had to worry about. Um, and that, that our vision was still the same, basically. That's amazing. That's kind of a dream come true acquisition scenario. It, it is. You don't you don't hear that often, and it was. That's why I didn't have my hopes up, you know, very early early on in the process because, like I said, it checked a lot of boxes that usually aren't checked, or I wouldn't expect to be checked. Okay. All right. So, what what did it mean for you personally? Like the first day you woke up and you realized you're going to work at your company as an employee, not as a, a founder. Well, not as a CEO, or uh, what? Yeah. What exactly changed? You know, I think it's it's different for everyone. Um, there are certainly founders out there that you know they have to to be the founder, and and that's exactly the reason why you would you would be acquired and then walk away and, and go start idea number two, and that's great. Um, and I think for me, the along with the other reasons we've talked about about why this made so much sense, um, another reason was just the kind of the stress level and the amount of time that I was spending 
on my works. And with our daughter being about two years old now, um, I was really, as the years went on, especially the last two years, um, I was finding, a, I, I was putting a lot of time into work and it was great because I enjoy it. And, you know, it's, it's something that we all enjoy doing. Um, but it was, it was pulling a lot from family time. And so one of the other reasons that, that I made that decision was to get some time back to be able to spend more with, with my wife and daughter. Um, so that was one of the things that I started to see almost right away. We had a lot of transition, um, work to do, which was, was, was fun and, and, and took a bit of time. Um, but that's really one of the, the first noticeable changes for me was that stress levels went down, um, a lot. And I was able to, to kind of take a little bit more time, um, and, and spend with, with, with family and not, not worrying about work or, or working. So. That's amazing. Uh, was there anything yeah. that, uh, in rec in retrospective, you would absolutely change? Um, not that I can think of, um, okay. you know, I think hindsight's always 2020, but I think that in terms of just the team that we've built, the product that we've built, um, I think we, we've done it all for the right reasons and with the vision that, that makes sense. Um, and I think that going back eight months, 12 months, if I was to see this decision again with SAS group, I think that it would, it still is the right decision. Um, and I think we've already seen that as we've continued to move on and grow with SAS group, that that's paying off in, in, in quite a few ways is just our team health is, is continuing to grow. We, we brought out an additional, um, a team member to help with marketing. Um, we are looking to add more team members in the next couple of years. Um, and our product, we have great plans to continue growth for. So it's been very positive in all of those ways, really exactly as, as we had hoped and, and for the reasons that we were acquired. Um, but it's, it's been That's very amazing. positive. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So what motivated you through this journey, through all the ups and downs? You know, different things at different times, because it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, an exit wasn't in the works or wasn't planned from either early on or really until last year. Um, so motivation wasn't saying, Hey, we're going to exit in, you know, two years left or one year left. Um, which I think was good because you, you can certainly have that motivation. And if it doesn't fall through, then that's, there, there's consequences there. Um, but I think a lot of the motivation was just that, um, kind of working every day and seeing that, that the product that we were building was making a difference. You know, it's not like we're, you know, building some obscure product out there where we're not talking to our users. We don't know what, what difference it makes in real life. Um, we, we really had a product that's still it's rather niche as it deals with accounting, of course, but that we were able to, to really talk to our users and, and see how it was benefiting them and, you know, have calls and emails that users are saying, oh my gosh, thank you so much. This is, we've been, Mary has been sitting at the desk for the last five years, you know, entering orders and she can go do something else now. So it's, it was seeing real world impacts that I think were, were very motivating most of the time um, to say, hey, we're making a difference and, and we're building something cool that, that is, is valuable. Um, and, and working with our team as we continue to grow our team, we've been very lucky with the hires that we've been able to make and, and building the team in the way that we have. Um, it's been so great working with them and kind of seeing them grow along with, with the rest of the, um, the company and, and just, just doing that as a team together. Okay, that's that's great. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. So uh, I just want to um, to ask about the changes that um, the acquisition meant for the product, and if you had to make difficult decisions uh, about it along the way. Yeah, I I would say yes, changes, but but really more in in accelerating the direction that the product was going. Um, because of course, before the acquisition, we certainly had plans of, you know, here's what we'd love to do, given of course, the resources that we had at that time. Um, and here's what, here's just the different options that we, we can see my works taking in the future of, of new products or new integrations that we build. Um, and so as we started discussions with, with SAS group, it was really less changes and more just call it kind of just acceleration or, or just, just more rapid growth because we talked about those plans and we decided that it doesn't have to be, you know, one to two year off plans. It can be plans in the next six months or the next eight months, given the resources that we would, we would have the additional time that would be on my plate, not having to deal with, you know, admin or HR or, or payroll duties, um, that we'd really be able to, I'd be able to focus on the product, which I loved doing. And because of that, and the additional resources we'd have, we'd be able to accomplish those goals a lot faster. Um, 
and of course that was just one of the the reasons that made that that relationship and synergy click so quickly at, at the beginning um but that's really what it's been going forward as well so really just just working on strategy together making joint decisions together um evaluating what what works together and, and what doesn't but really just accelerating what the vision was that we had um and adding additional ideas um but but just accelerating that growth so we're able to build that product faster um which is what we love doing and which is what we've been able to do so far I love how you know it, it is a no drama store. It's a very sustainable, uh, maybe not a, a very accelerated, but a great growth. And uh, you're being very um, happy with an acquisition and being able to keep your team and even uh, yeah. hire new people. So that that's amazing. So yeah. what would be yeah. your um, your advice for the founders who are considering an exit in their future? Yeah, a lot of factors there, obviously. And I think that the main one that I struggled with, or just maybe took the longest to decide, was what the driving reason is for that exit. Um, in my case, it was primarily just, you know, more more time with family, taking a step down and, and just, you know, reducing stress level a bit. Um, but for other founders, that, that can be certainly other reasons for, for good reasons, um, whether it's just to kind of losing passion in the, in the idea, and maybe at the, at the the same time having passion and a different idea that they want to jump off and explore um, or just knowing that they were building the product with an exit in mind. Um, I would, so I would say really just, just kind of figure out your one or two main drivers of what really is motivating you or, or factoring in your decision to an exit. And then, you know, use those to your advantage and play off of those, whether it's, you know, hey, I've, I've built a great product, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a builder and not a, a grower and I want to go jump off and build the next idea. Um, or I, you know, am, am just, I don't have the passion for it anymore, um, but, but use that to your advantage. And I, I think maybe th the one thing that benefited us most through the whole process was just transparency of saying, you know, hey, here's, here's the strong points, here's the weak points, both on our end and on SaaS group. Um, and just being, being very transparent with that because that helped grow a very stable relationship um, that, of course, is, is now very long term. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing that. I think those, those are very important points. And uh, well, uh, my last question is uh, is kind of a, uh, an icebreaker or, or just something that um, I want to ask every founder. Uh, and for every founder, it will be different. And uh, for you, it will be what is the SaaS related? Um, what is the... Uh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot my question. <laughs> Oh my God, sorry. Um, where is it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm so glad this is not live. Uh, what is the... <laughs> um, okay, so what's the sales related headline that you would love to see by the end of the year? Great question. Um, I think... The, uh, Lots of good answers there. I think for myself, I can see it would be great to see more small and, and medium-sized SaaS founders have success in the products that they're building. Um, of course, there's it's, it's very difficult on a lot of different levels to be a founder in SaaS and, and building the right product for the right reasons and have all of these different decisions in all different areas come together and, and be the right decisions um, to continue growing the way that, that the product needs to be grown. And it's very difficult. Um, and so I think there's a lot of SaaS founders out there that um, are building great products and they're, that they're passionate about. Um, and it would be great to see more of those become successful in what they define success as, whether that's successful just means scaling and, or raising another round, um, gaining traction in their market, or being able to exit and say, hey, I, I built this from you know one to five, that this exit will allow them to take it from you know five to 10. And I'm going to be able to go off and, and continue to do something that I'm passionate about. Um, so I think just, just seeing more SaaS founders that have passion for their product, uh, being able to succeed would be something that's great to see so, and, and very valuable for the market. That's amazing. I think that aligns with your whole story and with the whole vibe that you're giving. Uh, so uh, thank you for saying that. It's been amazing. Well, Peter, um, I'm really glad that we get to work together and that you and my works are part of, of SaaS Group. I'm also Thanks, the very same. recent addition, so I know <laughs> yes. I know where you stand. 
but thank you for, for talking with me about it and thank you for, for sharing your story and I hope we can do it again sometime. My pleasure. Looking forward to it. It was fun. Awesome. Thank you.